Okay, well, now this is Five Live, and I'm delighted to say that uh, hopefully, if all the technology works, the other end of this line, somewhere in the United States, is the wonderful Marielle Heller, who we've been waiting to speak to for a long time. Hello, Marielle. Hello, how are you today? Well, I'm doing all right. I'm in my spare bedroom, and the house opposite me is being destroyed by builders. So if it sounds a real racket, then you'll know the reason why. Everybody's dealing with different, you know, funny home acoustic <laughs> problems with everything we do these days. The, the yeah. technology has taken over. Are you, uh, we, do we find you in your lockdown house? Yes, we are lucky enough to be outside of New York City where we normally live. We got out to the country and are hunkering down living a farm, farm life. I feel like I've gone back 200 years, basically. <laughs> Have you found, before we talk about Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood, which which I can't wait to talk about because it's one of my favourite films of the year, have you found this period creative or have you found it just really frustrating? I think because I'm a parent, the productivity is not what I wish it would be. You know, my husband and I joke that we're very jealous of our friends right now who don't have kids in many ways who are able to use this as a big writing retreat and maybe pen the great next novel or screenplay that's going to win an Oscar or something. I think for us, it's much more of a feeling of, of treading water. We're just trying to get through each day, do a little bit of work when we can, homeschool our kid. We split up, we split up our day so we each get a few hours to work. But mostly it's about trying to stay sane, trying to stay happy and healthy as much as we can, and trying to stay connected to the people we love. Yeah, the builders have just started up there, Laurie, again. So I, I apologise if it sounds a racket coming from the London end uh, of this conversation. Anyway, A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood uh, streams from Monday the 25th. It's out on DVD uh, on June the 8th. What a picture. We we had a great time speaking to Tom just before the end of the year. We, we love Tom Hanks on this programme so much. We now finish every show with a feature that we call Hanks for Listening, and we find a little speech which which Tom has made in in one of his in one of his many fantastic films just to make everybody feel better because we feel as though he's oh, our spiritual leader. I love that. I mean, Tom is just such a wonderful uh, such a wonderful guy, and getting to work with him only made me more convinced of what a great person he is. And and he was just a really fantastic person to work with. And yeah. I hope I'll get to do it again. Was there anyone else who was ever in the frame to play Fred Rogers? Not really. I mean, there was a period of time where we didn't think he was going to say yes to the movie. He had turned it down, actually, a number of times before I came on board. And he ended up signing on largely because of the relationship he and I had before we made this film. We had gotten to know each other, and he had been an admirer of my films, and we had been keeping in touch over many years. But... um we did talk a lot about if it's not Tom, who would it be? And I think, you know, we felt like it would have to be an unknown actor. There's no real other hmm. movie stars who we feel the way we feel about Tom, you know, and Mr. Rogers is such a specific character. You have to feel a certain way about him. He has to kind of crack your heart open and you have to feel, you know, a real love for him and like you know him in a deep way. Yes. And so there, there really wasn't anyone else who was well known that we could ever imagine in that part. So you have two audiences, really, Mario. You have the audience in the States, obviously, who know Fred Rogers very, very well, and he's part of American TV culture. And then you have the, re the rest of us, and over here in the UK, I mean, I did know who he was because I'd watched the documentary about him a couple of years ago. So we were kind of starting to, to realise who he was. But there's a moment in your movie when Matthew Reese, who plays Lloyd Vogel, Matthew Reese's wife says as he embarks on this quest to interview Mr. Rogers. I, I, think, I think she says something like, I hope you're not going to ruin my childhood. Please don't ruin my childhood. Please don't ruin, ruin my childhood. I wonder if there are a number of Americans who said to you like that, as soon as they heard this movie was being made, please, please don't, don't wreck it. Oh, definitely. I mean, you guys in London, in the UK, as well as us in, in America, we've had a lot of our heroes fall from grace. We've had a lot of disappointing people over the years who have really made us lose faith sometimes in humanity. And mm. so everybody who would hear I was making this movie, that was the first thing they would say to me is, oh no, is there something terrible? Oh God. And I would have to go, no, 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 no. Don't worry, don't worry. He is what we thought he was. And I felt that when I came and premiered the movie in London where audiences 
were so skeptical, especially because the movie hadn't been promoted yet. It was we we came early with the film, and people were really scared that it was going to be something where it was going to ruin their feeling of nostalgia or their childhood. And that was never my intention. I had no, I don't have any interest in telling those stories that are going to make, particularly in this moment in time, make us feel bad about the world or humanity. Yes. You know, part of what was so beautiful about Fred is the more I got to know about him, the more I was moved by how consistent he was with his philosophy. He was somebody who truly walked the walk. He didn't just talk the talk. He believed in deep connection with people. He believed in children. He worked with child psychologists, and he was very radical in his beliefs about children and their feelings and why they're valid. He gave so much so much validity to children and their experiences as as much as if they were adults and especially when he started the show in 1968 that was really unheard of he was coming from such a deep place of truly wanting to help and to help the world and to help children and he really lived that in his life it was a beautiful thing to get to to get to uncover more and more details of his life and to find him to be such a purely consistent person he was somebody who had to work very very hard to kind of live the philosophy of who he wanted to be in the world that was not about his own ego, but was truly about being present for other people. But he really did it. And I think part of why I wanted to make this movie is because we have so few people, so few role models these days, particularly men who show us examples of what it is to be a feeling, emotional man who's trying to be just a good person. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if because of the way he spoke and because maybe to modern eyes the the tv presentation was a bit hokey it's easy yeah. to dismiss the fact that he was a radical oh i think even back then it was easy to dismiss that fact i think there was something about you know his sincerity i think we've been cynical for a long long time and somebody who is that sincere is very easy to make fun of i mean i remember doing it myself as a kid i remember kind of thinking he was hokey and for babies and something, you know, not cool about him. Although I loved him when I was younger, when I was little, but he was very easy to, to, to dismiss. And it was only really when I became a mom that I was able to go back to his philosophy and see how truly radical it was. And to see that there was nothing about his, his program that was trying to sweep anything under the rug or just be happy or cheesy. In fact, his whole philosophy was built around honesty and that you tell kids the truth and that you can talk about the darkest, hardest subjects of life and childhood and that kids need to talk about those things. They need to learn about those things and they need to, to learn about those things in ways that can feel safe to them. I'd like to ask you about one particular scene, which I think from, if I remember right, from our conversation with Tom, that is the I think about the first scene that you actually recorded, the scene between Fred Rogers and Lloyd Vogel in the restaurant. When Fred says to Lloyd, I want you to, re we're just going to take a minute and remember all the people who loved you into being. Yeah. And your camera moves around the table and I think we timed it. It's actually like a minute, 15 seconds. It's actually, long, <laughs> it's actually longer than a minute. Yeah. And I, I explained this scene to actually to Richard E. Grant and other Star Wars previous films because he was over to promote Star Wars. And I was telling him about this scene. He said, really? For a minute, are you joking? Because he hadn't seen he hadn't seen the movie. I know, and it seems to me such an important, such an incredible scene. And I think even Tom Hanks said to you, "Really, are we going to do it this way?" Can you just explain what you were trying to do in that scene? Because it seems to be sort of pivotal to the whole thing. Well, it's funny because Tom didn't actually tell me until later how skeptical he was about that scene, and he and Matthew <laughs> both didn't believe that I was going to actually keep that scene in the way that I had envisioned it. But it was the scene I felt the clearest about. You know, Mr. Rogers on his program, he would look right down the barrel of the lens and he would look at the kids on the other side of the TV set and he believed the space between the television and the child was a sacred space. And he would ask them to be a part of the show. He would ask them how they were and he would wait for an answer. And he was inviting his children, the audience for his program, to be active participants. And we knew we wanted to have this moment in the film where we were going to invite the audience to be an active participant in the film. Fred was also known for doing this. When he won a Daytime Emmy Award, he got up and instead of talking about his accomplishments or his, you know, what he does on his program or what he believes or the people who work with him, 
He got up and he said, I'd like everybody here to take 10 seconds. They only let him have 10 seconds. <laughs> and, and he did this exercise and he said, I'm going to, I want us all to think about the people who loved you into being, who helped you get here today. And you look around the room and it's all of these people dressed up in their finest glitzy outfits and tuxes, all thinking about themselves, all ego, all thinking about, am I going to win? Am I going to lose? You know, they're in this moment in time where that's what they're there for. It's this big competition. And he does this exercise and you watch one by one, everybody tears rolling down their cheeks because it's such a profound moment yeah. to say, let's look outside of ourselves. Let's think about the other people who brought you here, who loved you. There was a question I was going to ask Tom when I did the interview with him at the end of last year, and then we ran out of time because we were so busy trying to seek reassurance from the great man that things were going to be all right. But there are a couple of moments, and maybe this is incidental, and I'm on completely the wrong track. There are a couple of moments, particularly towards the end of the film, where Fred Rogers puts his hand on his back as though he's suffering from back pain. And mm. I know he died of stomach cancer in 2003, and I, and yeah. I wondered whether you were alluding to something that all was not well with Fred Rogers at that time? Was that yeah, your direction well, or was that what Tom had done? There were a few reasons for those choices. So, you know, he did die of stomach cancer. And one of the things we discovered when we were really doing research about Fred was he was almost like a priest. People would come up to him and tell him all of their troubles and sort of heap their stories on him. And he wanted that. He asked for that from the people he was interacting with daily. And then you would go to his wife and you'd say, does he share with you? Does he tell you about other people's troubles who come to him? And she would say, oh, no, he wouldn't betray their trust. He doesn't, he doesn't unburden that on me. But maybe ask Bill. Maybe he talks to Bill about it. And then you'd go to Bill and Bill would say, oh, no, he doesn't talk to me about other people's troubles. Maybe ask, you know, so-and-so. And the truth was he didn't unburden on anybody. He truthfully was like a vessel who sort of absorbed the pain that he was experiencing from other people and I think felt it very deeply. So part of what we wanted to allude to at the end of the movie was this idea that there was a price to pay for being such a giver, for being somebody who really absorbed and felt the pain of the world and other people's troubles. The other thing is because he was a puppeteer and he worked with these puppets for th right. 40 years, he actually had very bad back, upper back trouble from having his hand up above his head. And he always, up until the end of the show, was the one to operate all of the puppets that he voiced. And he would crouch in these very uncomfortable positions. And he had a lot of back trouble in his upper back because of that. Uh, I have two questions, Mariel, before, before we run out of time. The first one is an easy question. And that is, was it your idea to have Nick Drake's Northern Sky as the first piece of music that we hear? I love that song. And it was such a fun challenge to try and find the first song that was going to bridge <laughs> us out of out of Mr. Rogers' land into our New York world in 1998, which is when the movie was set. And Howard Parr, who's my amazing supervisor, music supervisor, who's worked with me on all three movies, I believe was the one who suggested that song first. Right. And it just fits so perfectly. It was the only yeah, It's song. my favorite song of all time. Well, so I'm so I, glad to I hear thought, that. I have never heard this in a movie before. It's got Tom Hanks. This is wonderful. And, uh, and finally, Marielle, I admit this is the trickier of the two questions what do you I know your industry is trying to work out what what it's going to look like when we're all allowed to go back to the cinema and when you're allowed to make films and get crews and get actors together what do you think it's going to look like when it, eventually you're allowed to leave your house and go and make a movie again mm -hmm. I wish I knew the answer to that I think that's where we're all living right now is this horrible feeling that we can't predict the future and it's hard to really envision what life will be you know it's hard to envision for me being back on a set with 200 people in production, which is my favorite part of making films. And it's the part I miss the most right now. And yet I can't, I can't envision how it's gonna work, which just makes me immensely sad. But I do know that storytelling and art is what's getting so many of us through this pandemic. I mean, I think everyone you talk to is talking about what are you watching? What's making you feel good right now? Yeah. What are the stories that are taking you away from your life in this moment? So we obviously are regaining a sense of the importance of storytelling, the importance of filmmaking, the importance of a good TV show, a good escapism. So I think in that way, there's that positive side to it. And I wish I had some magic ball to be able to see how we will make this happen. I'm having a hard time envisioning it for myself. I know a lot of people are talking about quarantining and taking over a hotel where everybody goes there two weeks ahead of time. 
and you know isolates before they start filming for me as a mom that's not realistic I want to be able to have my my life outside of being a director it's something I fight for on my sets I fight to make shorter hours so that people can go home and see their children and so having a whole set where you're totally separated from your family in order to make a movie for me doesn't seem realistic and it kind of goes against my bigger philosophy of what I think the filmmaking business should look like so I don't know I don't know but I know that we're going to need stories more than ever and as Fred Rogers would say anything mentionable is manageable I agree I agree Mariella Heller such a privilege to speak to you thank you very much for your time Oh, it was a pleasure.